Thanks, Ruben, very much. Pleasure to uh, be here with you. Trust uh, we'll enjoy uh, some lunch and some myeloma this afternoon. I know many of you are still getting your seats. There's still lots of seats up here. Ruben is very lonely in the front, so if you wish, you can come sit next to him. So I, I've been asked to talk a little bit about the two agents that, uh, as Dr. Anderson mentioned in his talk earlier, uh, have recently been FDA approved in the management of patients with relapsed myeloma, uh, carfilzomib and pomalidomide. So I do not have any uh, disclosures to present to you this afternoon. And I have two simple objectives. We want to talk a little bit about the critical data uh, that has recently been published and has led to the approval of both carfilzomib and pomalidomide here in the U.S., and to be honest, I, I really don't want this to turn into a data dump where we're just going over study after study after study. We really want it to be very practical. So um, I'll give you the chance, uh, I'll give you uh, an insight into uh, the practical use of these agents. I personally have probably treated uh, over 100 patients with carfilzomib and over 100 patients with pomalidomide. That's not to promote our cause, but as much to say that uh, we have a little bit of experience with these agents, uh, and we'll be happy to share some of that experience with you during the talk and indeed during the Q&A. So as you know, on the bottom part of this slide, uh, this is what we used to have for multiple myeloma. For those of you who remember the days of high-dose dexamethasone alone, uh, or VAD, followed by transplant with very few options at relapse. Obviously, this has dramatically changed now and the list gets longer. Uh, I've only listed in the relapsed category if you will, the big five, as we often call them, the five major drugs that we currently have approved. Uh, but you'll be hearing more from Dr. Anderson and others throughout the course of the afternoon regarding even newer agents that we have in the pipeline. The first, though, that we're going to mention today is carfilzomib. Um, I know you're going to have to get used to a lot of zomib names, ixazomib, oprozomib. Uh, but today we're going to talk about carfilzomib. As you know, two key individuals, Carla and Phil. Together make it carfilzomib. We thought about Reuben Josimib, but it didn't, didn't quite go over as well. Um, and as we heard already, and I won't go through this in great detail because Dr. Anderson mentioned it during the main session, uh, but this is a novel proteasome inhibitor uh, that is a next generation proteasome, uh, proteasome inhibitor after bortezomib that is particularly potent on target um, and has, as we're going to see in a moment, uh, a very significant advantage of not having significant uh, neurotoxicity. Indeed, in our early studies, there were very low rates of grade two and grade three peripheral neuropathy, really in the range of one uh, to 2%. This is always challenging to, ca to capture, as you know, because for many of our patients, simply having a plasma cell dyscrasia itself uh, can lead to neurotoxicity. Um, so only one patient in the 004 study who had previously been treated with bortezomib Ha, uh, had uh, uh, the drug discontinued because of peripheral neuropathy. We also saw that, uh, that's my seat actually, sorry, uh, but uh, there's, there's lots of room. You can come sit next to me. Um, carfilzomib is a single agent, and Dr. Anderson demonstrated this earlier, that um, had activity uh, both in bortezomib naive and importantly in bortezomib treated and even refractory patients that we'll talk about in just a moment uh, with response rates over 50% uh, and clinical benefit response rates of over 60%. Um, this uh, demonstrates a little bit more specifically the rates of those responses that we saw not only some CRs and VGPRs, but a significant proportion of PRs and even MR in stable disease. So the study that we're anticipating the results of, but of course is now fully accrued, will be the critical phase three study comparing carfilzomib, lenalidomide dexamethasone to lenalidomide de dexamethasone alone, and we anticipate that potentially we'll have results of that uh, within the next 12 months. Now, carfilzomib, of course, has demonstrated its activity, uh, no doubt, in patients heavily pretreated in the relapse setting, as we've demonstrated, in particular patients who have been exposed to both bortezomib and lenalidomide, and that indeed is the formal uh, FDA indication that patients uh, must have been exposed to an imid, be it thalidomide or lenalidomide, as well as bortezomib. However, uh, as we heard earlier and as we all likely know, Carfilzomib has also now been demonstrating activity in the upfront setting and has recently led to the NCCN recommendation that this can be an option used frontline. This is on the basis of a number of studies, but two in particular, the carfilzomib lenalidomide dexamethasone study and uh, our study that we call Cyclone, 
<clears throat> whenever you say the word cyclone, you have to drop your voice a bit deeper. So I should say cyclone. So you remember it a bit more. Cyclophosphamide, carfilzomib, thalidomide, dexamethasone. And not to go into a tremendous amount of detail, but this was a really comprehensive study that used four cycles of um, carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. Transplant patients had their stem cells collected. They went on, went on to another four cycles of carfilzomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone, then went into a maintenance phase where the dosing was a little bit lighter, and then into a maintenance lenalidomide only phase thereafter. Uh, this led to a very profound and quite rapid response, such that there was an 80% uh, response rate even by third cycle, and indeed by 12 cycles, 98% of patients had had a PR or greater. Similarly, we tried to evaluate the use of um, uh, cycle, uh, carfilzomib in the upfront setting, combining it with a well-known international combination of cyclophosphamide, thalidomide, and dexamethasone, or CTD, um, perhaps, if you will, saving the use of uh, lenalidomide and bortezomib for later. And, uh, sorry, and similarly, um, we had these patients who were anticipating uh, autologous stem cell transplant. Uh, the numbers are going to be updated at ASH this year, about twice the number that you see here, although the distribution of response is almost identical. At 75% of patients obtained a very good partial remission uh, within um, even just simply four cycles of cyclone, or cyclone. Pragmatically, what does this mean? And this is, this is the slide to, to pause your eating for a moment, if you may, and look. If you want to nap for the rest of my talk, just be awake for two critical slides, this one, and I have a similar one for pomalidomide. Um, how would I summarize all that we've learned about carfilzomib? I mean, it's clearly a very active agent, particularly well tolerated. As most of you know, in our first cycle, if not even only the first week of the first cycle, we do recommend reduced dosing by virtue of the fact that there have been cases of tumor lysis. You know, tumor lysis, frankly, is a side effect that we, in some respect, like to see because it demonstrates activity against the, the um, a tumor, but we also want to be careful that we don't lead to renal compromise or other complications. So that's one of the reasons why, in particular in your cycle one, the dose is reduced to 20 milligrams per meter squared and greater hydration is, is uh, suggested. Early on in the use of carfilzomib, there had been significant concerns about potential cardiac toxicity. Uh, uh, this was mentioned earlier in one of our talks when we went up to significantly higher doses. I would by no means want to pretend that that doesn't exist, but I would suggest that somewhere around two-thirds of those cases can be well mitigated with appropriate fluid management. We think that many of the cardiac issues that we ran into in the early days of carfilzomib had to do with the fact that we were giving 250 cc's of fluid before and after every dose, and in some cases, 500 cc's of fluid before and after every dose. And as we did that a little bit more cautiously and carefully, that signal weakened a little bit. That being said, there is still a cardiac signal, and I would suggest that this is actually a class effect, as we had seen this indeed with bortezomib, and for those of you who may perhaps in clinical trial have used other proteasome inhibitors, you may have seen that um, also. One of the questions that always comes up with, with carfilzomib is, well, can we use it weekly? Because currently we give it twice a week, three weeks out of four, so day one, two, eight, nine, 15, and 16, with then subsequently a week off. Can we give it on a weekly basis? Well, the jury is still out on that, but that is being explored in a several trials. Um, and again, this is not standard practice, but I have had some patients in whom we've used the agent for a long period of time. Their disease is under good control. We don't want to discontinue it entirely. What we've done in some patients is simply discontinue second week, meaning we give them day one, two, 15, and 16. So they still get four doses a month, but they have a week off in between uh, each two doses. Um, the lack of neuropathy, as we've mentioned, is uh, particularly attractive. Uh, especially in patients who we know are susceptible to this. And as I've mentioned, by giving you the uh, two uh, major studies in upfront therapy, uh, that this is something uh, that we look to uh, more so in the future. Well, what of pomalidomide? So pomalidomide is the next in the series of immune modulatory drugs uh, that you're likely familiar with. Most of us are still very familiar, of course, with thalidomide and lenalidomide, and now we've introduced pomalidomide. Uh, I sometimes, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, say uh, these drugs are not siblings, they're cousins. Now, I don't know what the laws are of individual states, uh, but um, what I mean by that is that although they're similar, they are clearly not identical. 
I would not like to look at pomalidomide, for example, as just a newer version of lenalidomide. These drugs are distinct, and that becomes important because we can use them even in patients who are refractory to or progressing on lenalidomide, for example, will demonstrate that some patients will respond to pomalidomide. So they're structurally really quite similar, uh, but there are important differences both in efficacy and target and indeed in their toxicity profile that I'll explain to you in uh, just a moment. So uh, we at Mayo Clinic have had the privilege of uh, treating, I think now over 450 patients with pomalidomide. As I mentioned earlier, I've had the privilege of it myself at least treating about 100 patients with pomalidomide, and we've come to be very comfortable with uh, this agent and uh, being able to modify it in different patients. We had our, our initial cohort looked at patients who had had one to three prior regimens, and then ultimately we looked at patients who had lenalidomide refractoriness and indeed dual refractory disease. So patients who truly progressed on both bortezomib and lenalidomide. In all of these situations, there was still evidence of activity. Of course, there's always going to be more activity when someone has been less pretreated, but even the very heavily pretreated patients, we see that somewhere around a third of patients uh, demonstrate uh, PR and around half of patients can have a, a minor response or greater. Uh, this just demonstrates this in, in a, a plot curve for those who are visual learners. Most recently, which was a late-breaking abstract at ASH last year, perhaps has greater significance in the European context, but I think still nonetheless important for us to understand was the POM low dex versus high dose dexamethasone study. I know in, in North America we frankly don't tend to use high dose dexamethasone as a standard arm uh, for uh, relapsed myeloma, but nonetheless for regulatory and other purposes, this study was conducted comparing these two strategies. And I highlight in blue here that these patients were ones who were, in, in a sense, that dual refractory group, those patients who clearly had failed both lenalidomide and bortezomib. And if you're a provider who cares for patients with multiple myeloma, you know that this, up until recently, has been the most challenging situation to deal with. What do you do with that patient who truly has progressed on both agents? Can we still use something from those same classes? And indeed, um, this study was designed to look at that uh, group and no surprise that pom pomalidomide with low-dose dexamethasone demonstrated not only improved progression-free survival, but indeed improved overall survival, uh, and hence uh, its uh, likely greater use in uh, European situations, with a response rates significantly different uh, at all levels of response in uh, over 500 or nearly 500 patients treated. So again, this is the second slide that if you want to wake up for a moment and listen to, this is the key points that I want to make regarding pomalidomide. You know, if, if I were taken and said, what is the critical difference between pomalidomide and lenalidomide? Well, we've seen, first of all, that it can be very active even in patients with lenalidomide refractoriness, but it's very similar. I mean, it's obviously, it's an oral agent. We have very similar toxicities. I would suggest that it has perhaps a little less myelosuppression uh, the degree of which that we see neutropenia um, is, is less. Um, you know, one of the things that we struggle with in patients, in particular those who have been on higher doses of lenalidomide for longer periods of time, is the fatigue factor, very often mitigated by dose reduction. But we have other side effects such as diarrhea and muscle cramping. That is, if you care for patients on long-term lenalidomide, as you know, that can be an issue. Thankfully, thankfully, we see significantly less of that in the pomalidomide. We do see patients with fatigue. We do see patients with myelosuppression. I don't want to minimize it, but we see less of it than we do in lenalidomide. The dose ranging is interesting. I agree very much so with what Dr. Anderson just said at the main session regarding the, the dosing. Although you think of four milligrams, of course, being twice the dose of two milligrams, the therapeutic window of this drug is quite narrow in that there really isn't a massive difference between those two. And as we start using this drug more so in combination, as we're using it in patients who are very heavily pretreated and have beaten down bone marrows, don't think that when you go from four down to two milligrams, in a sense that you're giving someone half the therapeutic effect of the drug. In fact, the difference is minimal. So I'm very comfortable in a lot of my patients, and in some of them, for example, even starting just at two milligrams because of the activity of this agent, even at two milligrams, usually uh, with indeed low-dose dexamethasone, be it 20 or 40 milligrams weekly. Like the rest of the class of immune modulatory drugs, uh, it is necessary that these um, uh, 
agents uh, uh, have thromboprophylaxis with them. Again, that's a whole other subject of discussion, but we still follow the general rule that in standard risk patients, low-dose aspirin is sufficient. If patients have other high-risk features of thrombosis, have had a thrombosis before, or have known risk features, then it may be necessary to fully anticoagulate them, either with uh, low molecular weight heparin or uh, full-dose Coumadin. And we're starting to understand now, not only in combination with dexamethasone, uh, but literally with almost any other agent, uh, we have found this drug able, we're able to combine it, uh, be it as, you'll, as we heard briefly earlier with carfilzomib itself, using carfilzomib palmdex, adding it to cyclophosphamide, uh, adding it to uh, various other agents. In fact, we'll be presenting an abstract at ASH this year of combining palmolidamide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone together with a significant success. So my final slides uh, is really meant to merge all that we've learned uh, thus far about carfilzomib and palmolidamide together and say, what do I do with the patient in, in my clinic tomorrow, or the patient I had in clinic two days ago, who clearly met the criteria for both of these agents? So I mentioned earlier carfilzomib's uh, F formal FDA indication was exposure to an imid, be it thalidomide or uh, lenalidomide, and bortezomib currently progressing. The indication for pomalidomide is almost identical, perhaps slightly narrower, in that someone must have been exposed to lenalidomide and bortezomib and currently be progressing. So a lot of people meet that same criteria. Well, how do you decide between the two? Well, I like to explain to my patients that both of them are, are highly active. Some give greater or less credence to the notion of class switching, which is to say if someone is currently progressing on an immune modulatory drug, would I prefer to cross over to a proteasome inhibitor and vice versa? I think good and cogent arguments can be made on either side. I think we demonstrated in both of these agents that one can respond to them even if progressing on an in-class drug but that may influence your choice. Um, and then, of course, toxicity and convenience becomes important to patients. Um, if a patient, as the one I had in clinic two days ago, said, look, I just live a couple of miles from the clinic, it's really not a difference for me. We had a deeper discussion about what it was like to come in twice weekly for IV therapy as opposed to taking an oral agent. But I think what's important is it's somewhat analogous to the early days of lenalidomide and bortezomib where we struggled a lot with which one am I going to use when, realistically, most patients are likely going to see both, either sequentially or potentially even in combination. So I, I, one of the things I hope to even to demonstrate in, in my talk this afternoon, uh, when I resoundly trump Dr. Palumbo, um, uh, is that um, you know, we need a longer-term strategy as we think of patients with multiple myeloma. The days of thinking that most of our patients are, all, are going to succumb, sadly, to their disease within two years, thankfully, have gone. And so we need a longer-term strategy. So when I sit down and talk to patients about whether or not they should go on to palmolidomide or carfilzomib, we try to look at the long-term strategy and what is it that we're trying to achieve, what's going to be best for them now and in the long term, knowing that they're both viable options. Well, I hope this has given you a little bit of a summary of where we are in the clinical trials work with these agents, but hopefully more so even just pragmatically how to use them on a regular basis. And we look forward to your questions later if anything wasn't clear. Thank you so much for your attention.